Clothes rule the world. Humans do not exist to wear clothes. Humans exist to be worn by clothes. No, go, go, go knit a big old sweater for the ER. Best time to wear a striped sweater. I mean, um, yeah, so welcome back to this episode. I have a show where we talk about a show's English dub and let you know if the anime's worth watching. And I mean, if you haven't heard of Kill La Kill, how? I think this is one of the most memed shows in the last decade or so. And for good reason, the anime is insane in the funnest way possible. Yeah, Don't... it is an anime. Yes, but it's the fun type of anime. It's stupid. Well, for those who don't know, Kill la Kill was the first anime done by Studio Trigger. You know, those people who left Gainax after Gainax was, well, kind of dead or dying or something. You all know Trigger. They made Darling and the Cucks. I mean, Franks. It's not like everyone got cucked in that show by the end. Right? Yeah. They also did Keys Diver. Who remembers that show? Right, I... That was a show. Anyway, it would air in 2013, with the director being Hiroyuki Amaishi, the guy that did Gurren Lagann and uh, worked on Panning Stocking with Garter Belt, which actually that makes sense with how etchy that show is compared to this. Yeah, and, that makes sense. And the writer is Kazuki Nakashima, the writer of Gurren Lagann and BNA. Which I think that's also a trigger. That also makes sense. <laughs> well, Aniplex of America, because they hate you, managed to get the rights to this and put out the dub in 2014 for Bang Zoom. Hey, the show would even air on Toonami. And anyone Tsunami wants to. Air shows? Yeah, before they died. And anyway, it's like, oh, no, Toonami's still on. Yeah, but maybe 10 people who still watch them. Do you name- can you even name ten people who even still have cable anymore? <laughs> That's a valid point. But yeah. Fuck you, Antiplex. There is no reason if anyone wanted to own this show, it should cost 150 US dollars here. That is bullshit. So, I guess we should get into what this show's about, huh? Where do we even begin? So, our main character is Ryukos. She tries attending Hinoji Academy to get information on her father's killer. Killed my father, prepared to die. And, yeah, upon arriving there, she quickly finds out that this place is run by the student council who have what are known as Goku uniforms. Basically, spe special clothing that give you, what? Powers stop or some shit. The, uh, stop beating around the bush. It's a, it's also a magical girl show. I was getting every, to that. And every other genre they can think of. Yeah. So the Goku uniforms, which clearly give the uh, students that she goes up against a much uh, bigger advantage. It's okay, because apparently her dead father left her not just one half of a scissor blade to fight with. But also, what's known as a Kamui, literally a living sailor uniform that can even talk. That gives her extra strength, speed, and all that bullshit. I should be talking to you right now, if, if the voices weren't muted. Exactly. And, um, yeah, the Goku uniforms also go up in rank. You have one star, two star, with the Elite Four, because Gurren Lagann being the three stars. And they're led by her, Ryuko's eternal rival, Satsuki Kiryuin, who has her own Kamui as well, her own living sailor uniform. Though hers doesn't talk, because it's a basic bitch. So, yeah. Satsuki basically challenges Ryuko to climb up the ranks, and if she can f fight Satsuki and beat her, then she'll tell her everything she knows about her father's killer. That's the basic premise in the beginning, but in the back half, oh my god, this show really loses its shit. <laughs> but 
There is a I whole mean, thing I, I, about the uniforms. I mean, with that summary right there, you pretty much just summed up eight, uh, at least eight episodes of it. it, it it's that breakneck speed. Yeah. It's not taking itself seriously. This show is meant to be an homage slash parody of Shonen, Magical Girl, and basically every th action thing you could think of. Because, of course, whenever they don their Kamuis, they do the Magical Girl transformation for them. And, I mean, they're scantily clad while wearing them, so, of course, there's fan service abound for everybody. As far as the back half of the show, oh my god. So yeah, the Goku uniforms are run by what are called life fibers. And the Kamuis are made of 100% life fibers. And you find out what that means, and it is insane. The writer of this show is clearly on some form of drugs. I don't care what anybody says. Especially after seeing Back Arrow recently, too. This man clearly has not learned. Hold on, I think I'm getting something. Apparently, this show has spacing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I... Because every trigger show has to end in space. Yay! Not gonna spoil anything else. All we're gonna say is the show is still currently on Netflix till a week from now or so. And the epilogue OVA is not on Netflix. And yes, that OVA is actually somewhat necessary to wrap up everything even that much more. I mean, the continuity of it is kind of stupid. Yeah, we'll get to that later. <laughs> so... It's short. Yes, go watch Kill a Kill. Show's amazing. The animation die, how was it? From Trigger. Um, they're, they're just, they just try to make it as weird as possible. But that's the fun part! Right? Right? Well, as far as the OST goes, it's done by Hiroyuki Sawano. There's two Hiroyukis working on the staff. Yeah, I mean they even make make a gag scene of someone becoming 2D to dodge an attack. See, that's how you know it makes sense. <laughs> yes, it just works. But yeah, Hiroyuki's OST is Attack on Titan. He worked on that and Seven Deadly Sins, which, yeah, Sins is, you already know our opinions on that. It's kind of dicks, but the OST and the dub were the two of the best things about it, so. And, there, and, you, can so, and you can tell it's, it's the same composer. <laughs> this is honestly my favorite OST by him, though. Especially with the earworm. Look, I don't care. I'm just gonna call the song Don't Lose Your Way. So everyone knows. That's, I mean, that's, that's, that's... Yes, I know your body is very dry. Yes. yes. Good luck getting this song out of your fucking head. I mean, anyways, yeah. Especially if you have it on Spotify. <laughs> so, th th yeah, this is probably one of my favorite OSTs. Hands down, every song is great. No, no, we got that out of the way. How does the dub hold up? Okay, this is probably one of the best dubs Bang Zoom has put out. I, I can't argue with that. At least in a quite a while. So the script and ADR were both done by Alex Von David, who we covered here before on Erased. And uh, Sayo. And he's probably one of, if not the best, director at Bang Zoom. Unless you have a counterclaim, die. You remember Erased. What? Why don't you watch the live action Erased? I'm, if I go back to that, I'm dragging you along with me. A likely story. <laughs> anyway. So yeah. He also voices a couple of ad voices. The monster. But at least he didn't cast himself as a main. Anyway, on to the characters, and we've got quite a few to run through, so let's get to it. First, we have Ryuko Matoi, our protagonist, voiced by Erica Mendez. You know, going from Hunter x Hunter or Aika from Genshin Impact. 
And Ryuko is very, well, I guess, pissed off in the beginning again, wanting revenge and all. And also she's tomboyish or something, I guess. How in the beginning? She... What? And if you don't, uh, 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 and if you don't believe how much the, the song is an earworm, I'm pretty sure it's in the dirt, her bio on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and this is easily one of Erica Mendez's best roles to this day, too. Which I could say that for a lot of people in this dub, but especially for her. You she could tell she loved this role. Voice out, all, out. Yeah, so Zach Aguilar's ad voice is in this show because he was just starting out. And what was the story you said he told on the uh, one of the Genshin Impact streams? Uh, How they met after she was done recording she, a session or something. And she was just exhausted and because <laughs> she just got done recording screaming for an hour. Yeah, again, this show parody Shonen, like we said, so you get a lot of screaming each other's names while they're fighting, and screaming on top of their lungs, not, and all that not stuff. Not just fighting, I mean, 90% of the dialogue people are just screaming. <laughs> yeah. After her, though, we have her Kamui, her sailor uniform, Senkets. Voiced by David Vincent. You all know him, Nanami from Jujutsu Kaisen. Or Grim Gel, I guess. But his mo- I like Grim Gel. I'm a Grim Gel fan, girl. Wait a minute. <laughs> anyway. Actually, some of the- oh, speaking of Grim Gel, some of the OST so sounded clo close to the Grim Gel theme. Yeah, it kinda did. <laughs> but yeah, David Vincent also does a great job. So Senkatsu comes alive when he drinks blood, and you get to hear him in the beginning, Give me your blood! I need more! Please! And... Do you think he had fun with this role? Because I don't think he had to really match any flaps, did he? Um, sometimes. I love how there's a scene where he's crying, and Ryuko's like, Stop crying! You're becoming all wet and gross, and I'm wearing you right now, you know? And I'm just thinking, clothing can cry. I... I think I'm more confused than anything. You stop us clothing is alive, and that's where you draw the lion? Yes! Anyway, Ryuko's eternal rival is next, Satsuki Kiryuin, the basically the person who runs Hinoji Academy. And she's voiced by Carrie Carradine. You know, Sailor Galaxia from Sailor Moon, or Mommy from Monica Magica. Where is the second season of Gaiden? Guys, where's the dub? No coming, is it? But die, oh. she's she's ad voices in the Sonic X series. I guess that dub really does exist. I hate you. Get the <laughs> fuck out of here. <laughs> On the subject of Sonic, no, I am not. I am not looking forward to so Sonic Frontier. You totally are. Don't you dare lie. <laughs> the gameplay they put out works. Really bad. <laughs> you know what's not bad though? Her performance as Satsuki. Satsuki is the complete opposite of Ryuko, hence the whole Eternal Rivals thing where she's prim and proper. I don't know why, a lot of her stuff reminds me of, like, female Virgil. That's the best thing I could compare it to. I mean, speaking of opposites, her comedy is white and blue. They did the red oni well, blue oni shit, didn't they? Black and red. Yeah, of course they did. Yeah, hers Conway's named June Katz, by the way, but it doesn't talk, so... Because it, it's, again, basic. No one cares about June Katz. So yeah, if you wanted to hear, uh, I guess, what it would be like if Carrie Karen and voiced a pseudo-female Virgil, that's what you get. It doesn't help oh. that she uses a katana. <laughs> it just but... writes itself. Exactly. Well, after her, we have Ryuko's best friend and the meme lord of the show. Mako Monkonchok. Is that a shell doll? Maybe someday. <laughs> and
again, she's voiced by Christine Marie Cabanos, which I remember a couple years back, it was like five shows in a row I covered with her in it randomly, but then there was a dry spell without her. But now she's back. I mean, it's Nepgear from the Neptunia series, right, Dai? Allegedly. And best girl Marie Rose in DOA. Why here? What? I, anyways, um... Yeah, so this is also one of Christine Marie Capano's best roles. Mako is literally insane. No, there's no getting... She is fucking insane with how many... What would you call them? Tangents or rambling she goes on? Yeah. Especially with how fast she talks. Like, there's a scene where Ryuko loses at a game of tennis, and Mako goes, No, Ryuko won, Ryuko won, Ryuko won, says it like eight times, and then goes, And I could prove it, too. You see, even though she lost the game, she's still my friend. So she won with friendship. And everyone knows if you win with friendship, you win at life. That is literally her whole character is going into tangents that are just random as hell out of I'm nowhere like that. I'm speech like that never happened in an official show in anime. I made again making fun of that shit is what this whole series is doing so but yeah I, I get the feeling this might be one of her favorite roles I don't know it's not like you can say that about the entire cast yeah speaking of Mako let's move on to the Elite Four and start with the one that the fandom ship her with Gamagori. Including the bloopers. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> we'll get to those. So Gamagori is the head of the disciplinary committee. And... Yeah, I guess we could go over his powers. We'll go over the powers of each one of them now that we're at the Elite Four. He's a masochist. Yeah, his Goku uniform, the more you attack him, the stronger it makes him until he himself says this, he reaches his climax and unleashes all of his power. The sexual innuendos are over the top of this, of course. It doesn't help that Patrick Seitz, who voices him, is even shouting, Yeah, that's it, I've been a dirty boy, keep hitting me! Yeah. He's also wearing a ball gag. Yeah. But talking some perfectly. <laughs> he's a ventriloquist, man. I mean, after all, he's Dio and Jojo. And Ragnar, I, I guess, mean, in Blaze Blue. If you don't think the sexual innuendos were enough, I mean, don't forget Ryuko was saying that the outfit makes her look like a... <laughs> yeah. And Mako's brother, who we'll get to later, is like, Wow, you're so cool running around with your scissor blade dressed like a hooker? <laughs> But yeah, Patrick Seitz owns this role. Again, it's his typical, like, militant type role that you'd get him typecasted in, except turned up to 11, because it's this show. After him, we have Jakuzare. Best girl. Right, Dai? Yeah. And she's head of the music club, so she attacks with public domain music. Do 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 do. It's just not the same. Sig Without Siegfried. Chris Kaysen wasn't even in this dub, man. It would have been great if he was there as like one of her yes men or something. But yeah. And she's voiced by Sarah Ann Williams, Uni from the Neptunia franchise. Hey, another best girl. And Misa from Full Dive. And you you're not a hooker. I am a hooker. I told you know what my former job was. Anyway, but hey, look, I Sarah Williams is having a lot of fun with this show. Just like everybody. No way. <laughs> And, oh. yeah, she's giving off her typical Sundere, or as I call it, Sundeer performance for this character. Especially with how she acts towards the other Elite Four. Girl of text-to-speech. <laughs> Fuck you, text-to-speech. 
After her, we have Inomuta, the nerd of the group. Fucking nerd. He's the tech person. His clothing is even called the probe regalia because he basically probes information from people. He also might or might not be typecasted. Yeah, so he's voiced by Steve Staley, who for some reason went under the pseudonym Steve Cameron or Cannon. Why? Yes. That's not even like if you wanted to go under an alias, you still use your first name, man. Hi, David Ernest. Well, he's Hitsugaya from Bleach, and he was the Birdman chicken thing from Gurren Lagann. So I'm pretty sure they did that as a pseudo nod with the casting in this. You would say that if it was remotely even the same character archetype. Yeah, but he's hey, he's one of the Elite Four again, so it's cool. Then yeah, it's Steve being his typical Steve self. Being a nonchalant smug prick. Like, I'm the smartest guy in the room. Even though I'm the only guy in the room. Wait, what? <laughs> well, the last member of the Elite Four is Sonagayama. Who's the head of the Kendo Club, so he fights like typical samurai person. And he even goes blind at one point for a majority of the series. Yeah, this happens in the first handful of episodes. In order to make up for him losing, he's like, My eyes, I relied on them too much, but now all my other senses are stronger. And... Okay. It's so dumb, if you take it serious... <laughs> hey man, there's barely any blind people in anime. I'll take what I could get. And it's this show, so you can't even get mad at how stupid it's I mean, treated. You already, have, you already have Bleach for that. And Saint Seiya. Yeah, kind of weird that it keeps being shonens that are doing it, and no other genre. Oh, even FMA had a fucking OVA with a blind alchemist. Anyway. Sonic is voiced by Grant George. You all know him, right? Brad Wong from DOA, Kagura from Blaze Blue. Those are two literally the same character, but you know what I mean. And he's also Izuru. Raise your head, die. Is that a joke? Well, anyway, he's having the time of his life with this role. And come on, he's fucking samurai that can move really fast. He's awesome. How's he not your OC, die? And his whole thing is he likes to fight strong opponents, which is why he follows Satsuki. Because he hopes one day to fight her in a one-on-one -on -one duel and defeat her. Now on to the other characters. Next we have... Well, I didn't even bring this group up, but I guess it's time to now. Mikizugi. He's a teacher that works at the school undercover for the organization known as Nudist Beach. A, a group rebelling against clothing because clothing is evil and taking over the world. Yes. I didn't stutter. And he's voiced by Matt Mercer, who for some reason is barely in anything anymore. Speaking of things, he's Leon in Resi 6. I, I think we're like two of the only people on the planet that don't have high hopes for the RE4 make, but that's because we learned after 3 make. Wait, I'm sorry Capcom. guys, come on! It's Capcom and Resident Evil. Resident, they haven't had the Capcom great- Capcom and Resident Disappointment, exactly. <laughs> yeah, he's also Levi in Attack on Titan. You know, the midget. <laughs> Which, when he's disguised as the teacher, you heard the voice he's doing, right? It's, yeah. I don't know, it just sounds really weird to me. He's doing his normal voice when he's not incognito. Yeah. I mean, it's close to his Leorio voice. But Leorio's a teenager. Yeah, hard to believe when you're like seven foot something. <laughs> yeah. Compared to everyone, everyone else who's barely pushing five, foot. <laughs> well, at best. 
After him, we have the other nudist speech member, Kinagase. Die. There are two things you need to know. He says that so many times. <laughs> and he's voiced by Keiji Tang being typecasted because of fucking course. You don't know yeah, him. Yeah. Retsu from Baki, which yes, we're totally doing a whole breakdown on that series. I keep hearing how amazingly over the top it is, and I want to see it. And he's Archer from Fate Unlimited Blade Works. It's also Gojo, I guess. Because it's required to mention he voices Gojo and JJK if he's ever in something. Oh, is that an unofficial role? Apparently. And, yeah, like we said, he's typecasted. He's doing the whole, yeah, oh, I'm badass and I know it. I have a needle gun that can take out life fibers and strip people. Love. Next, we have the um, other major antags of the show. First, we have Hardy Mae, the Grand Couturier, as they call her. A.K.A. the one who um, manufactures the life fiber stuff. She's voiced by Stephanie Shea. Or Usagi from Sailor Moon, or Haruka from Ah, My Buddha, Ah, My Brother. I had to. I'm sorry. And Hardy Mae is, uh, psychotic law is the best way to sum her up. Free delivery, indeed. What? What? Uh, no, no, no. We, we already mentioned Carrie Karen in earlier. I. I got there. What's up? I, uh. There's, there's no one to bully JYB in this, I'm sorry. Yeah. I mean, JYB is here for only an episode. But yeah, Stephanie Shade is great as. Psychotic Lolly Harime. Done. We, we don't mean psychotic in the fun Mako way. We mean in the likes watching you bleed and gets off cutting people up kind of way. She is the one where they do the animation joke for. Yeah. After her, we have the one she simps for Satsuki's mother, Ragyo Kiryuin, who is. Yeah, you find out real quick is the real big bad. And she's voiced by Laura Post, who's... Okay, now I'm gonna butcher this. Is it Yelan or Yelan from Genshin? Yelan. Okay, well, there you go. Yelan and Genshin Impact. And Melissa from BNA, so I still haven't seen. So, you'll probably know who that is. I don't. A minor recurring character. Well, she does her straight-up R4 voice for this character, even down to the R4 laugh, because she's so evil and ham! Ah, oh, la, Kyum. Steam clams. She even goes on about how um, the primordial life fiber will be god to humanity. Did we mention the show is over-the-top stupid? After her, we have a few side characters left. First, Mako's family. Her mother is voiced by Erica Harlocker, Shinobu from Demon Slayer, and Venti from Genshin Impact. Look, die another best girl! I know what I said. No, that doesn't make any sense. And because it's Mako's family, she's, oh, they're all pseudo-insane as well. Bakelly doctors, am I right? Yep, that's her father, who I spy Michael Sorich. You know, Tessai from Bleach, trade secret. And Dimple from Mob Psycho, which yes, I am hyped for season three. Who isn't? And yeah, he's a back alley doctor who apparently admits at several moments to selling patients' organs off on the market. <laughs> I just love when Mako sports that out in one of her brantings. Gamagori just goes, Do you have any idea what you just admitted to? <laughs> no, she doesn't. But yeah. And both her parents do a great job as them. Next, we have her brother, who is the only other person who went under an alias. But. Yeah. She's voiced. Or T's voiced by Felice Sampler under the alias. 
when's he eaten? Always had more effort put into it than Steve's. Anyway, you probably all know her as Beauty from Bo 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 That Show Is Drugs. And Cody, everyone's favorite character from Digimon Adventure Season 2. No, seriously, everyone hates that character. Yeah, that's why he. That's why he, he's their favorite. <laughs> <laughs> and her brother is a pickpocket. Yeah, he likes robbing people for money. He gets caught for it too a lot of the time and gets slapped. And the last member of their family is Guts, the dog. Who just goes, Guts. Voiced by Derek Steven Prince, who's Iggy and JoJo. See, he's typecasted as doggies. Oh, oh, but Iggy's an asshole. Exactly. And he's also Keitaro from Love Hina. Seriously, why isn't that show been remastered in the U.S. yet? Um, bec because you'd rather watch By the Number Trash Harems? I mean, Love Hina's the progenitor of Trash Harems, though. <laughs> yeah, but those ones are just... Pale imitations and by the number, anyways. Well, I mean, what do y'all want me to say on his performance? He just goes, guts, guts. That's it. Sometimes even in the background, so if you don't pay attention, you probably wouldn't even know what it is. <laughs> as far as the last couple characters, next we have Iori, the head of the Taylor Sewing Club for Satsuki's group. He's the one that basically makes all the Goku uniforms for the Elite Four and stuff. Ayori, voiced by Todd Abricorn. Natsu from Fairy Tale. Then Oberon from SAO. You know, the attempted rapist. Damn it, SAO. Don't look at him that way, he's not an infected. Murphy? Yeah. Oh. That makes sense. No, you you clearly mean Todd Stone, the all brilliant air alias. <laughs> well, after him we have Satsuki's bust, but Butler. There we go. I had a stroke for a second. Salare. Yes, you do. Voiced by Doug Stone, who's literally just playing Valkenheim from Blaze Blue. That's it. He's literally a butler to a very higher upper class character. But I, I don't remember him turning into a werewolf. It was in Who the Uncut episode. You must have missed it. Trust me, if you look, it's there. Yep. Oh yeah, he's also a uh, Swanzo in Outlaw Star. So he's know me. <laughs> but yeah. And again, I feel like Butler's are his typecasting. He feels like he fits right at home in this role. Here was your team, miss. Pretty sure I heard him say that a billion times in Blaze Blue. Also, I'm, pr he, I'm pretty sure he said that at, l at least twenty times throughout this anime. Yeah, only two left. Next, we have Haomaru, who is Ragyo's secretary, I guess, and a simp for Ragyo. Voiced by Christina V. Riruka from Bleach, and Killora from Hunter x Hunter, which means yes, we have an HXH reunion here. Though this was dubbed before HXH, so I guess Hunter x Hunter was the Killa... Yeah, Killa Kill would be... or Hunter x Hunter would be the Killa Kill reunion? So... Yeah, there's not really much to Haomaru, she's just... someone who fell in love lesbianically with Ragyo, because Ragyo saved her life. So she wants to help her achieve her goals. And that is why we're saying the OVA is necessary, that because the OVA does involve her and wrap up her entire character thread. So... And since we're on, we're on the subject of the OVA, the timeline is stupid. The OVA takes place before the end credits of the final episode. Yeah, so when you watch Ep 24, the last, like, 30 seconds of the entire finale take place after the OVA. No, the last whole entire 
ending montage sequence, right? Yeah. Right, yeah. That's yeah. what I mean. Yeah. yeah. I, I stopped there with 30 seconds. seconds. It's like two minutes, whatever the fuck timeline it is. But we saved the best for last. Oh no. <laughs> Takerada. Oh. <laughs> Who's voiced by Ben Diskin? And yes, he's a very minor character, but he is the greatest character who will leave a long lasting impression. Two episodes of his life. <laughs> Yeah, man, my name's Takarada G. That is how he talks. His whole character. Foster than a pumpkin slap a hoe. Yeah, man, you might have shut down my network, but who needs that when I got these grannies around? These bitches can spread a rumor faster than a pimp can slap a hoe, yo. That is quoted basically word for word. That's his whole character. It is amazing. <laughs> As far as the ad voice recycling, I mean, honestly, it's not really that bad. Realistically, a lot of people probably aren't going to notice how much it's recycled. I think Laura Post might have been the worst one in terms of major characters, but... You, wouldn't, you probably wouldn't even notice. Yeah, because she's doing a different voice for the ad voices, and it's also an episode where Rakio isn't in. So. And one of them is literally over a loudspeaker. And look at that, none of the main characters, like the major, major mains, are at double casted or ad voices. None of them are talking to themselves, or after themselves. Yeah... Can we just let Alex Von David ADR direct and casting for all of Bang Zoom shit? So, no. in short, this dub is fucking great. This is back when everyone still gave a shit and everyone brings their A-game. 100%. And should you watch Kill a Kill? Hells yeah. Come on, this show is amazing. It's stupid over to the top. It, it, you just have to pre prepare yourself for the drugs. Yeah, we actually had a friend that took this show 100% super serious. And it's like, why? You're not supposed to. You're supposed to have fun with this show and laugh at the absurdity. But yeah. As far as the last couple of things, what? I mean, why would you take a show seriously that doesn't take itself serious? Yeah, it kind of defeats the purpose. And we've seen what happens when Trigger try taking themselves overly serious. Right, darling, in the- I totally didn't rip off Evangelion Franks. I think Trigger should stick to this type of anime. Did you say BNA is pseudo-stupid also? Yeah. People actually like BNA. Yeah, that's what I mean. It's stupid in the fun way. Yeah, I mean, they also have Little Witch Academia, which is really good too. So, either way though, um, yeah, last couple of things worth mentioning, there are a bunch of bloopers, and they're only showing at conventions, so you can look them up on YouTube. I guess Andy Puck's like, no, we don't want to include those on, on the Blu-rays or whatever. Which Alex Von David is known for doing that with his shows, like he did that with SAO also, where he shows the bloopers and outtakes at conventions. So, I, I think that's great. More people should do that, more ADR directors. Because, like, fine, okay, I won't include the bloopers in the Blu-ray, but you can't stop me from showing them at these convention panels. But die, Satsuki's gonna show you... HER VAGINA! <laughs> of course. <laughs> or Maka going, OH MY GOD, A TITAN! <laughs> As far as if Kill a Kill will get a sequel, it technically did. Kind of. The Kill a Kill game, Kill a Kill If, or Inverse Fate. It's the closest you're going to get to a season two. They got all of the original staff back together. The entire dub cast came back. All the OST from the anime. Which, seriously, why is it so hard for anime licensed games to use the OST? I think Kill a Kill and Demon Slayer are like two of the only ones I know of. Plus, you can think of any others. You know, that one game. 
Like, fairy tale, the game should have done that, man. Yeah, but what fun would that be? But yeah, if you've seen Kill I Kill and haven't played the game, the game's cheap enough, so go pick it up. It's close you're gonna get to a season two with its all new original story. Or more, or, or more like an, another couple of ovas, but still. I mean, the, yeah, the story it's around six to eight hours, so. Also, fuck the Hari may fight in this game. People who've played it will know what I'm talking about. It was really fun. Yeah. For reals. I guess that's it, though, unless you want anything else to add, die about how clothing are going to take over the world and wear us, because clothing are the reason we're intelligent. You don't want... Exactly. You evolved because of clothing. Don't you understand? So, we're dumb, then. Yeah. Also, nudist beats aren't actual nudists. They're oh, just yeah. nudists yeah. until everything is over. Oh, yeah, that's right. We didn't even mention that real quick. How, um, they have DTR, the mech. Yeah. You know the nudist speech members? Because this show also has to poke fun at the mecha genre a little bit, too. I mean, some of the Goku. Oh, I mean. Yeah, like Sonic Ayama's Goku it. uniform. Isn't that a mech, too? Yeah. I think. Yeah. Yeah, honestly, you could tell this anime was... It's one of those made by anime fans for anime fans. You could tell everyone involved on both the dubbing side and the Weebanese side were, like, massive anime fans. Like, you know what? Let's just go all over the top with it. Show everyone how much anime means to us. And it worked. Though, if you're looking for something overly serious, this probably isn't the show for you. Or if you're newer to anime, you should probably avoid this until you're used to how stupid they can get. <laughs> that too. But all I can say is... Thank God for fan service, die. What everyone's looted in this anime. I mean, if you're a fangirl and want, like, say, you know, Matt Mercer's character, well, he's a nudist. Who has really shiny nipples. Himself. For some reason. Yeah, every time he takes his shirt off, he, his nipples are falling, and he's the only one. Maybe that's piercing. I don't fucking know. But yeah. I guess that's it. We all obviously know that uh, every piece of the dub are clearly Erica Mendez, Carrie Karen, and Christine Ricabanos. Those are the top three, though everyone does a great job in this show. No Andrew Ruth Vans at all this go around. Man, we've had like three decent dubs back to back. Megalo, Devil's part timer in this. Oh, you also forgot to mention episode 16. Oh, you mean the recap episode? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's called. They basically treat it like the. Here's the recap episode, and then they sum up the first 15 episodes in 30 seconds. David Vincent does, and he talks at such a breakneck pace. He sounds like he had real fun with that, according to those bloopers. Yeah. He's yeah. like, Ryuka fought the head of the tennis club, the head of the boxing club, the head of the that he gets tripped up because, uh, your mama. So that was great. Oh, and for some reason, Ben Diskin kept f fucking up during the bloopers, we could tell, uh, because they kept playing it on the boxer character that he also voiced. That was only there for, like, you, one episode. You would think it would be the other one. But no, I was a boxer. So. Anyway, great show. Would come highly recommend. If you've already seen it and are looking for something similar, I mean, I guess there's always the other trigger stuff. You said BNA. I mean, BNA is not over the top like this. Well, then I guess go with Back Arrow. It's done by the same writer, and it is also over the top stupid. So... It takes itself semi-seriously. What, BNA? BNA. Yeah. Uh, when I saw him, I just assumed it was gonna be stupid, like, oh, it's gonna be over-the-top dumb, isn't it? And I see the trailer with the... What is it? The... 
main girl that's a furry or raccoon girl or something. So that's why when I was like, yep, that's Trigger. It is Trigger, but it doesn't, it doesn't go full this. Oh, so it's like LWA where they're reined in a little bit. Because LWA also has some triggerisms a little bit. But in the fun way. During their comedic moments, yes. But yeah, so... It's short. Go watch BNA, LWA, or Back Arrow. Back Arrow especially if you want something very close to Kill on Kill, because that's probably the closest you're going to get at this point. It just uh, kept going. <laughs> just like this. <laughs> Hell, it even, it even had them going into space at the end. I'm starting to think this writer might have a fetish. That's how you buy space. Anyways, hope you all enjoyed. Thanks again so much for watching. As far as what's next, don't know yet, but it'll be something. You're next. Oh my god! Anyway. <laughs> Hope you have a great day. Thanks again for watching. Let us know who best girl is and why Jacuzare is the answer and not Ryuko. Die. I don't think anyone's going to agree with you. Fine. Why Mako's the best girl? I can deal with her being second place. <laughs> Favorite quote, by the way. When Mika's, uh, Sugi, you know, the teacher, yeah. said that Maka rides the short bus. <laughs> <laughs> he basically called her retarded. And with that, I hope you have yourselves a great day. And I'll see y'all next time. We'll be back sometime soon. I wonder how many... <laughs> Till next time, guys. Have a great day.